Hi guys. So, Java 9 has finally been released. So tonight I'm gonna share with you some of the main features that has landed to that new version. Just a word about me. My name is Laurent. I'm working for Zenica. I'm a consultant mainly around Java technologies and web technologies. So Java 9, it's basically Jigsaw. So I think that all of you have heard about Jigsaw. Jigsaw is really the main feature of Java 9. And Jigsaw was needed for two reasons. The first reason is about security. Uh, in Java, you have you had no ways to, uh, to disallow people to use part of your library. And this was uh, a main issue even in the JDK because there were some uh, internal libraries that were used, like Con Misc Unsafe, that was used by many and many libraries like Mokito or something like this. And that was an issue for the JDK team because they didn't want people to use that. So that's the first reason why they introduced Jigsaw. And the second is about performances. Uh, Java come all at once. You have no way to just pick part of the JDK or the JRE to create a new smaller version of the JDK and then make it run fast on smaller devices. So these two reasons have come to Jigsaw. So Jigsaw has landed. And basically, if you know Node.js with the notion of export and requires, it's kind of the same. So here I have two. Uh, two projects, one main that is using a library. And basically, that library has two, two services. One that it may be used by people, and why that should only be used by the, the library. So this one is inside something called the internal. And that library didn't want to expose it to other people, but to have a good structure of the library, they had to put it in a different package. And in Java, you have no way to limit the scope of a package. If you, want, if you don't want people to use that class, that class, you have to put it in the package you want to use it. And then you have to remove the public keyword. So basically, you just remove that. And it's only uh, visible for that package. But then, because of that, uh, you need to change the structure of your library. And most of the time, it's not good. So now, with uh, Java 9, you can just create module. So to create a module, you just create something called module-info. And that's all. You just give a name. Here, the name is not is important. Uh, by default, IntelliJ gives the same name as the module name in IntelliJ. But you can change it. It's not required. And then now you have a Java 9 module. And if I go back to the main, no, I'm not able to access to that library. Because I need to say to Java, hey, I want to use that library. It's exactly like Node.js. If you want to use something in Node.js, you have to import it. Now it's the same with Java. If you want to use something, you have to import it. So in order to do that, we'll transform this into a module 2. And if you just do that, now you can require up the library. And now you can use what the library provides to you. But for the moment, it's not enough. Because the library has to say what it exposed. To do that, it's really easy. You go to the module use exports, and now you can type the module you want to export. That's all. So here I have the com.lma module. And now I can access to that class. I still don't have access to the other class, but it's OK. I'm not supposed to use it. So this is the same as with send safe. If people don't want you to use part of, your, of their library, now they have a way to do that. Uh, and this is really important. So basically, this is the minimal way of using Jigsaw. If you know Node.js, for you it will be easy. Uh, there are more than this. Uh, basically, 
tac, tac, tac. Uh, the same goes if you use a class dot for name. If you want to use a specific class using class dot for name, for instance, let's say this. You have to import it because if you try to run this, uh, okay, it will fail. <laughs> uh, it will fail because now in Java 9 you have to say, okay, I want to use Java.sql. Java.sql here is not directly imported by Java because now all the JDK is divided into smaller modules. You have one main module called Java.base that is automatically imported. And then you have multiple modules. And every time you want to use one module, you have to require it. So just need to require it. So here it's going there. And once required, that's OK. You can use it. And that's magic. And that's all what you need. If you use Maven, there may have a lot of issues, because you cannot ask to all uh, libraries maintainers to update all the version of their libraries to add that module info into their libraries for you to use it. So for that, they created something called the automatic modules. So when you have one dependency, let's say uh, commands long, okay, Java we automatically automatically create a module called commands dot instead of the dash length free, and so you can just import that and use uh, the library. So here, just do something like this, uh, commands dot length free, length free, okay, it's recognized, and now here from there I can use anything from, uh, from the library. So that is only to help people migrate to Java 9. It was really a requirement before releasing uh, this version of Java 9. Uh, there are more than this. This is really the basic syntax based on uh, requires and exports. Uh, there are a lot of things like require transitive. It's like when you want to uh, open, uh, it's like when you want to give access to libraries that will uh, access to you. You have something uh, to require static. That means uh, that there will be a check during the compilation, but there will be no check during the runtime. Uh, you have to use open and opens if you start uh, using reflexivity. And you have something with provides with use that is kind of uh, dependency injection. So, okay, this is really the basics of Jigsaw. Uh, Jigsaw deserved its own talk because it's really complex. There are a lot of use cases that are really hard to handle. And, but if you can start a new application, maybe it could be interesting to, to work with. Uh, if you plan to migrate from Java 8 or Java below 9 <laughs> to Java 9, uh, good luck. Uh, another cool thing with Java 9, in my opinion, because it's not the opinion of all the people, if the J shell. So now, in Java, we have a shell. And OK, that's something that, in my opinion, was missing in Java. Because sometimes you just want to test something. You don't, you don't want to just open your uh, IDE or just create a new project because you want to try this. And even for new people, when you start Java, most of the time, you have to have uh, an IDE. And if you don't have IDE, you have to understand how to compile everything. But you just want to, to do some tests. You just want to do 1 plus 1. You just want to do, uh, I don't know, foo dot concat something. You just want to do basic stuff. And now you can do that in the JHL. So this is really cool for newcomers. And the JHL is really well designed, I think. For instance, the two things I created are automatically saved into variables. So for instance, there is something called slash bars that helps you to see all the variables declared. And here, you can see that it created two variables, $1, $2. And now, I can pay with those variables. For instance, if I try to print 
dollar what's dollar dollar one okay it's the result of my operation so inside the shell there are really a lot of things that are really cool uh, you can see the list of the command you typed you can see the history of all the real commands so uh, slash list is just uh, java operation you performed and list is all the uh, commands you typed uh, you can edit method because it's not easy to type a method in the shell so once you declare the method you can use something like edit uh, method name and then it will open i don't know if it's work if i didn't create it okay it doesn't work but it open uh JWT, uh, JWT like uh, window that is really ugly, uh, but you can edit it, and but you can also decide to open, I think, a Notepad or something like this. Uh, there are some uh, imports that are already done, but you can choose to import your own uh, library. You can open files with the open command, uh, and so on and so forth. There are really a lot of things inside this shell that is really. Cool. So basically, you have the help that helps you. You have auto completion, uh, for instance. Okay, it's really working well. You have history. You can navigate through your uh, all your commands. And in my opinion, this is really a good thing, especially for new people. Or even sometimes you're not sure. You don't know what the type of this. Okay, now you know it's a double. Because yeah, you don't have to run the main. You just open the shell, and that's okay. And just for the people who use IntelliJ, there is an integration. Uh, there is a JShell console, so it's directly there, it's free, so it's cool. Another thing, there are good improvements with the process API. Uh, if you have ever tried to play with, the process API is just a mess in Java 8. So, for instance, here, this is one of existing way to uh, get the current PID of the of the Java that you're running. But this will not work for me. I'm using Windows. Too bad for me. So I have to find another way. And well, basically, I don't know how to do that in wi <laughs> on Windows machine. <laughs> and uh, Basically, it's really hard to do because okay, nev nobody knows how to use this. Every time you want to use uh, readers or something like this, you have to Google to check okay, which reader I have to open, which how to use it, how to combine them, and this is just a mess. So now you have a new API for that. Uh, so something called process handle, and you can get the current, and the current is the current thread you're working with. So from there, you can just display info. You can just display the PID too. And that's easy. Now it doesn't depend on the platform. And that's really, really nice. Uh, other thing, you can start uh, process. So for this, we have the process builder. The process builder is not new. Right, it's there since uh, Java 6 or something like this. It's it's quite old, but it's not that used. I see a lot of code using runtime.exec. But the process builder is better. And OK, with this, uh, so you can do the same, basically. You can just start it. Uh, you can just get the process. Oops. And from there, OK, you created a new process. And the process, so what you can have is same information, information PID. You can even now, using the onExit method, uh, wait for the process to end easily by using a compatible feature. And now, if you want to wait for the process to end before continuing uh, your job, you just use something like this, for instance, or what you want. And then here, you can, you can do some work can do some work, okay, the process will still continue. And when your work is done, you just wait here and poof, you merge. So this is the asynchronous way of uh, doing things in Java. Uh, other things is when you start a process, uh, from the current process, from the process you created, you can see uh, the children's 
So, no, it's not this one. Process. So now, if you launch, if you launch, uh, 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 if you launch an application or anything, you can just be, you can just listen to them. You can just know what you just launched, and that was really hard to do before because you had to run a specific command to get the PPID of the command and then check that the PPID match with the PID of your current process. And this is only for Linux. So if you used Windows, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and the same, now you can also have all uh, process handle. You can have access to all the processes. So if you want to do uh, uh, navigation across all the processes to check what is run or anything. So all uh, these announcements are really good, I think, for, for this. Uh, what did I do? OK. What happened? OK. So this is for the process API. There is also a new HTTP client. If you have ever tried to use the old HTTP client, I hope for you that you switch to a, a library <laughs> because this is really a mess. Uh, basically, it looks to something like this. Uh, okay, you have to open a connection. Okay, why not? And then you have to do things like this. Okay, this is uh, only if you do, for instance, post request. You have to pass data and to pass the, those data, you have to use stream again. And to use stream, you still don't understand why so many things. OK, why not? You have to write bytes. Ooh. OK, so basically you Google. And the same goes for the answer. OK, you send the request. And now to get the request, you use buffered reader, stream reader. OK, and OK, basically that's really complicated. Another thing is the first HTTP client they wrote was written in, uh, for the first version of Java, so in 97, something like this. And it was not designed for HTTP. It was designed to many protocols. So that's why it's so complicated. And that's why they wrote a new version again, because all those other protocols that was targeted at the beginning just, okay, just disappeared or are not used anymore, have their own libraries. Uh, to use it, uh, you have first to require, to require it. And if you notice, the package name is a bit weird. It's using JDK incubator. That means that it's experimental. So if you want to use it, you can, but there will be a release, so Java 10. And in Java 10, the API may change. So you can use it, but just be aware of that. Uh, HTTP, where is it? Here. So. You have to create an HTTP client. Okay, now you, you have access to it. HTTP client, and you can just create a client. And with the HTTP client, you can just send send a request. So a request, what is, does it want? An HTTP request. Woo. That's nice. So now it makes things easy. You have a request, you have a response, you have the object that corresponds to this. So you just can just create the request. So basically, it's using builders. So that means that it will be dynamic. So you can create part of the builder then, and then just add headers for this one, headers for this one. You can just change dynamically the type of the request, something like this. For, for instance, here I can just decide that this is a get. Uh, here, I just have to uh, add the connection, the, uh, the URI. So for instance, here. I want to call Google. Uh, come. And that's all. Here you created uh, a request, and you understand what you create. If you want to add headers, you can. You can just type headers, and OK, the value you want. So the <laughs> value, and so on. Uh, boom. So you pass the request here, and the the other parameters is how do you want to handle the response. So you can you have directly uh, multiple implementation available. So basically a string, as file, or as something. So I will just use here 
a string. Uh, OK. And this return, what? An HTTP response. OK, some things that I understand. And from that response, I can just get the body. Ooh. So that's something that is really easy to do and something that you understand. Uh, here, the dot body. OK, may I try? Ooh. OK. Document has moved, but OK. So now you have an HTTP client that is really easy to use and that is designed to use with HTTP2. And after that, OK, that's all. OK, no, that was all. Because Jigsaw has been delayed a bit. <laughs> And, but thanks to these delays, they added a lot of features in the uh, JDK. They didn't wait uh, to just um, delay all the other features they could uh, just embed it directly into the Java 9. So thanks to Jigsaw, we have many features that just, that more interest us as developer because as developer, maybe Jigsaw is not that interesting. Okay, you can create modules. Okay, it won't change how you code daily because what matters is how you can handle the language. And for that, Java 9 is not really a good uh, version because it won't really change how you, you code day to day. So there are a few, few things that are, I think, quite of cool. The first one is the reactive streams. So if you have heard about Spring 5, no, they allow you to uh, do uh, reactive streams, reactive things. And if you know a bit uh, JavaScript, you may have heard about observables or something like this. So uh, reactive streams is just uh, a standard provided by the JDK to create your own uh, observable mechanism. So it's kind of easy to, to write. Uh, there is something that is really important is the implementing something called a back pressure. So this is something to give you the control about how uh, many elements you can uh, listen to, you can handle. So for instance, here I created a, a subscriber, right? With uh, the method you can find for any published subscribers mechanism like on next, on error and on complete. And there is also an unsubscribe thing. Okay. And from there, you will start saying, okay, this is how many elements I can handle. If you don't do that, for instance, if you write this, you won't receive anything. For instance, if I start this, okay, I have the subscription, but I receive nothing. Here you see, I receive nothing. But if I remove this, and run this again. Okay, I receive elements. So this is what they call back pressure mechanism. It's really to give uh, implementation the control of how many, how many elements they can handle. And this is really important because if you don't do that, it won't work. And the same goes for when you uh, receive an element, okay, you have to say, okay, I receive, okay, I, uh, I handle that element. Now I can handle X more elements. If you don't do that, the same, you won't receive more elements. Another thing to notice is streams are by default asynchronous. So for instance, if you don't run something like this at the end, you will see nothing. Because basically you just send an element and then the JVM stopped and your subscriber have, have don't have the time to to just listen to the element and to handle them. So just be careful, streams, even if they don't look like they are some things to be asynchronous. That's really important. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, implementation, there is Rx Java. Okay, there is Rx anything. And Rx streams. Uh, collection, there are few improvements about collection. And this one is really cool because most of the time when you want to create, for instance, a list, if you want to create a list, you have to start with an array, okay. 
or you can just do add, 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 but most of the time you want to do it in line because you just want to add two elements. You don't want to write 10 lines just to create two elements. So what you do is just, okay, use arrays as list or you use this weird notation. And things are worse if you try to create unmodifiable <coughs> sets or list. And here I'm using string.off and for maps, you can do anything. <laughs> so now, with Java 9, you have off for any uh, type. You have set.off, okay, you create a set with one, two, three. You have list.off, the same, one, two, three. Uh, okay, and you have map.off, where you can add key, oops, oops, and value and so on and so forth. One thing to notice, this creates a new table collections. So once they're created, uh, you, you can do something like add.put. If, if you do so, it will fail. It will tell you, okay, no, you can't modify it. It's really designed to be a new table. Uh, but if you want to handle this, you can just create a new list with the list you created before and add all the elements. Because when you create uh, a list uh, statically, most of the time it's something that will be used either directly, either by other list. It's values you know and that will be used later. So if the unmodifiable thing is an issue for you, there are ways to, to make it work. And one last thing is here, you have you are limited to nine nine elements I think so if you need more elements you can use map dot of entry and just create entry like this boom, 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 and create many entry as many entry as you need so okay just need to add the values and it works <coughs> there are also new features with streams. Okay, so this is different from reactive streams. So, one thing that was missing uh, is imagine you have you have a stream like this. How can you find the condition to pick element until the five element, the the value five? Okay, here. Okay, I know the order. So limit four. But if I don't know the order, I cannot. There is no conditionally, there is no condition way to stop a stream. So Java 9 gives us, with the take while method, the ability to do so. So you do something like this. And basically, here, you said, OK, I want all elements that are below 5. And then I don't want to listen for any elements. So here, you will get 1, 2, 3. Five, and that's all. And okay, let's just check it's working. Uh, okay. So here I should get only one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah, because okay, because this condition. And you can do the same in the in the other way. So you can just skip elements until a condition is met. So this is called drop while. And this is doing the same thing. And basically, if I think uh, the issue with the take while was one of the most quoted in uh, Stack Overflow. It's why they put it in uh, Java 9. Uh, my cursor. Uh, another thing is with Java 8, we have something called iterate to give us an uh, infinite stream of elements, but you have no way to stop it. You can just limit the number of elements you want. So you say here, oh, okay, I want 10 elements, but that's all. If you want to wait for a specific value, okay, you have to find a way to implement that yourself. Now, there is a second method, still iterate, and here you just pass a condition. 
for instance, like this. And now the stream will stop when the condition is met. Uh, this is really like a four. Four, one, two, this step. So the reliability is the same. Another thing, but this this one about optional. Sometimes you want to fetch value from different services, but you never know when you get value. So you use optionals, but then you want to keep to take the first element that you got. So for that, there are multiple ways. The first one is to use stream.off. So and just listen for the optional is present. If the element is present, okay, I want it. So I get the value, and I just want the first element. There is also another way using the or else get, but this one needs to do an infinite chain. This is not really good. Now you can just do, you can just use the or function that will wait for a supplier, and here just return the next supplier, and here you just return the next supplier, and so on and so forth, and this is chainable. And that is really the good thing. And then you can have multiple providers. And even if you don't know which one will, go, will give you the value you are waiting, you have a, an easy way to find it. Uh, what's the feeling? OK, it's supposed to be a function. Another thing is, OK, when, when you have an optional, OK, you can run something if there is a value, but how to handle if there is no value? So if there is no value, OK, you have to use if. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> so now there is something if present or else. The bad way, OK, they could have provided something like if present dot if empty, something like this, or if not present or something like this, to make things chainable. It's not the case. Here you have no choice. You just use if present or else. And then here you just provide uh, two suppliers to handle both cases. This is what will happen if there is a value. This is what will happen uh, if there is no value. And two last things. Now you can create a stream from nothing, like an optional. And you can transform an optional to a stream. So now both uh, can collaborate in a better way. And uh, now, you don't need classes anymore, because with interfaces, you have public, you have static, and now you have private. private. So don't use classes, just use interfaces. No, no, I'm joking. It's because, uh, you know, as they introduce default method, sometimes you had to share a code in all the default methods that you created, but you had no way to share it. And that's why now we have private method to share those codes between uh, uh, methods. And there are a lot of, there are more things. Okay, I won't introduce everything. Uh, the add deprecated has been enhanced. Now you can add parameters to indicate from where to where. Uh, the trial with resource will auto-close uh, services that implement auto-closable. So you don't need to do a finally anymore, where you check the, the things if uh, it has been created. You just pass it, and it will be auto-closed. Uh, you have the stack working API. So this is to, uh, to navigate through the stack when you have an error. So now you have something that you can use with streams. So you have a stream, and you can navigate through the, the stack. Uh, you have HTML5 Javadoc. They also introduce the underscore. No, underscore is a keyword. It's if you have a lambda, and you don't care about the parameter, just use underscore, like in many languages. Many languages, you have a lambda expression. You don't care about the parameter. You put an underscore. This is the same. Uh, we discussed about it just before. So GE1 is now the default. Uh, garbage collector. I think it was there since Java 6, 7. Okay, so it was. Uh, you can, like you said, you can directly uh, use it with Java 8 if it works. <laughs> uh, you have 
GMH, GMH, that is a Java micro benchmarking that helps you to do benchmarks. Uh, ooh, something that is really wonderful. Now you can create properties files with UTF-8. So we waited like 20 years for that. <laughs> that that's crazy. 20 years to render a UTF-8. But, uh, Okay, nobody cares because everybody is using Spring and it's not an issue, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a new versioning mechanism. Uh, before Java 9, so the version was 9.8. something. And the something was a uh, computation with, uh, if it's security uh, versions and add a multiple of five. Uh, it's a patch version, but it's odd, then add two, but it's uh, just odd, just add two. What? <laughs> so now you have to just three, three numbers. The first one is major, the second one is minor, and the last one is security. And that makes things easier. Another thing I didn't put here is the multi-jar release. So this is mainly for uh, libraries maintainers. It's a way for you to create multiple classes, the same class with the same name, but targeting a different uh, JVM. So for instance, you have a node library. You don't want to write everything. You just want to write a specific class for Java 9. Then you can, you can say, OK, this class will be run only for uh, JVM, for the JVM and Java 9. And this is using a specific class loader. Uh, you can find information on Maven. So there are more, that are 91 GIPs. So if you want to take a look, this is the link to get all the GIPs. Uh, this is the link to the slides. Yeah, here it's 2017 because I gave a talk in 2015. Yeah, no, no, 16, at the beginning of 16. <laughs> and thank you all. Uh, any question? Well, I find underscore is a bit weird way of uh, writing the code. I mean, I mean, the, don't you think that it will impact the readability or sort of a thing? Okay, in JavaScript I use that a lot. So I even in Go, in Go you know you can skip this because in Go you can return multiple values. So sometimes you just don't care about the first values or the last, mainly the first values. You just want to check the error, and then you put underscores. So for me, it's not an issue. I, I use that in many languages. So, but for people that are not used to, maybe at the beginning it will be like, what the fuck is <laughs> underscore? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's also the default in Kotlin and Scala. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that you will find that in almost all languages. So considering the. Uh, that's interesting, but the other thing is like uh, like the way the J shell has come into picture now. Do you yeah. think they're like trying to say that Java can also act as a scripting language to like it just write something? In? Yeah, maybe, it maybe. Is, uh, like giving a new definition yeah. to Java. I, I think so. I think the, they want to just target new people because okay, for anybody that know Java, basically they won't use J shell. Okay, everything is set up. Uh, okay, it will be faster to just create a new main run it from the main, then going to the J shell. But when you don't know Java and you don't want and you don't care about Java C or how every, how you have to um, you know because in Java you have to create packages and at the beginning of the file you have to put the right packages. But when you start Java you don't understand this. It's like what the fuck what why I'm doing this? I, <laughs> so I just want to run one plus one so that leave me alone. So I think for new people, it's really good. And uh, any language is at its own uh, uh, shell, where you can just do some tests. You can just uh, import a library and just play with that library. For these use cases, I think it's really cool. You just give the jar, and you play with the jar. That's, for me, it's really interesting. Yep? Uh, if you, I see you showed uh, from uh, IntelliJ, uh, mm -hmm. it was fixed the 
project crashed out when you lost launched the chat? I don't know. I didn't try. I just noticed that. Uh, <laughs> I think that would be like. Uh, I think it not, could. Not so much for the year, but. Uh, I think it could be cool that. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of just creating the main, you just run the chat. Yeah, yeah, I think it could be cool that from the project you pass all the class pass, including your code and the jars, and then you do some tests from there. And I think for IntelliJ, it's not that hard to do. OK, maybe. Maybe it's really hard to do. But <laughs> I think that the shell is there. They have all the class pass. So I'll know maybe we should call that module pass. And uh, give that to the, giving that to the JShell, I think it's not that hard, I think. But uh, not working with the <laughs> IntelliJ. <laughs> Actually, I was quite amazed by like the way now interface definitions are changing person by person. Uh, considering now private methods have also come, so I mean they are like like the definition of a class versus a interface is also like it's yeah in a way I would say yeah basically yeah and more with that is with Spring especially with Spring data you know you you create a method and depending on the name of the method you run some code. So yeah, the, the interest of classes is decreased a bit, but still you don't have the protected uh, modifier. <coughs> and uh, can can you create? I don't remember if you can create uh, properties from uh, an interface. I'm not sure of that. You can? Uh, not. I mean, you can define constants like. Perfect, yeah. Final, yeah. You you still have limitations, so there is still an interest to to use classes, and basically you should only use interfaces to to expose something used by other people. You should not put that much code. I think for me, it's not that good to allow people to put code in the interfaces. It's okay, my opinion, but I don't like this feature. So I know that they need to add more and more things to interfaces just because they allowed people to write code in interfaces. So, so that maybe that means that in the future they will keep adding things in interfaces because, okay, no, there are private methods, oh, okay, but there is that use case that we want you to handle because. Uh, it's just a mess. Uh, we want to create a specific uh, property for that use case. So please handle this. And okay, yeah, interfaces are looking more and more like classes. I think it's not a good thing. And I don't, I don't really like writing code in uh, interfaces. I really try to avoid this. Yep. Have you ever tried JMH? Uh, yeah, I tried that, but one year ago, so I don't remember anything. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, it was really easy to use. I remember I had no issue with it, and I was able just to run little benchmarks really fast. But I don't even remember what I wrote. I, I think I have some code somewhere in GitHub, but uh, now I, I cannot remember. Yep. I was just about to ask, like, any other new collections being introduced in uh, uh, Java 9? Mm, I've not heard about that, no. Uh, what I didn't talk is there are a lot of string improvements that have been done. Uh, they changed the size of strings, of characters in strings. They, they really did a lot of improvements for strings. They really did a lot of improvements for Unicode support. Uh, for security, they removed a lot of old uh, tools that you can find in a bin uh, directory that either are not used anymore or either need to be used now. Like, now you have tools like Jlink, JDEPS to get dependencies for your uh, modules, something like this. You have uh, Jlink, I think, is for creating uh, JRE, depending on your code, and something like this. So they really, before they delay that <coughs> much, before they delayed that much uh, Java 9, it was really focused around Jigsaw. And it was not that interesting for developers. Now, with the improvement they did on streams mainly, uh, that's interesting. OK? Thank you. <laughs>